A giant beast is said to roam North America. Up to 10 feet tall, weighing up to 1,000 pounds, and covered with foul-smelling fur. The face is something I will never forget. It looked perfectly human. Many dismiss it as a fantasy. Everything that we've learned about Bigfoot is sightings by individuals not qualified in science. While others have spent decades collecting evidence trying to prove its existence. The similarity of these footprints is remarkable. Who or what is Bigfoot? It is most likely a large species of ape. Could it be true that one of our earliest ancestors is still living among us today? You can't be a skeptic anymore. You can't deny what you saw. Is Bigfoot a case of mistaken identity? Some kind of elaborate hoax? That's all this was, was a, a big joke. It, it got into something way bigger than what it was supposed to be. Or could the truth be hidden in the complexities of the human brain. It's not true. It's a lie that our brains are telling us. Using rigorous analysis, we examine the facts. We are going to run a little experiment here. And pull together the missing evidence. The implications would be astounding. To find the truth about Bigfoot. The Pacific Northwest is one of the most majestic places in America, a land of giant trees, dense forests, and rugged mountains, a place of mystery. It is here that more people than anywhere else claim to have seen one of the most legendary creatures on Earth. I've lived in Colville, Washington for 14 years. I've spent 75 to 80 percent of my time in the woods. I'm an avid hunter, outdoorsman. I consider myself pretty smart as far as what the normal wildlife is. In 2013, retired Army medic Jason Miller was hiking in northern Washington state with his wife and two children. It was your average 90, 95 degree day just the perfect day for a family hike in the woods. Near the top of the trail, Miller heard something far from ordinary. My son was in the lead, and he stopped right here, and he pointed up into the trees, and he says, Dad, do you hear that? We could make out something walking up in the trees. It was not your normal sound that a moose or an elk would make. This sounded as if it was a person walking with extremely heavy feet. Jason's wife and son had already gone further ahead, but his daughter Haley was walking close by. My dad had called me back, and he said, Haley, come here, do you see this? He was tall, like six, seven feet, but kind of like crouched almost and had like big, broad shoulders. And it was like a dark brown, light brown kind of color with long hair. It had large muscular arms and a very broad shoulder. But the face, the face is something I will never forget. It looked perfectly human. Stories of primitive humans walking on two legs, lurking in the remote corners of the world, have existed for centuries. In the Pacific Northwest, the creature is traditionally called Sasquatch, thought to originate from the native Canadian word Sasquets, meaning wild man. In Australia, aboriginals tell of a beast named Yoi, and the people of Tibet speak of a giant half-man and half-ape they call Yeti. These stories were largely dismissed as folklore until an incident in the Himalayas changed everything. In 1951, a team of adventurers was making one of the first ever attempts to climb Mount Everest. Among them was British mountaineer Eric Shipton. While scouting a new approach route, he discovered a series of footprints in the snow. The photos he took seemed to provide the first clear evidence of the existence 
of a giant bipedal creature. Seven years later, new evidence was found, this time in America. On a construction site in rural California, a man named Gerald Crew discovered a set of giant footprints. He made plaster casts, brought them to the local newspapers, and the name Bigfoot was coined. When the news hit America, the country was captivated. But in 1967 came the biggest news yet. A short film was released that claimed to show an actual Bigfoot. The filmmakers Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin said they had encountered the creature near Bluff Creek in Northern California. I was watching the creature and it was walking away. But I could see the face real good and I could see the eyes. And these things happen so rapidly, it was just like happening like, you know, heartbeats. The film caused a sensation, and before long, purported sightings of the creature exploded. They've seen it. It's Bigfoot, they say. A hairy thing with huge feet, red eyes that glow in the dark, and that's not all. It's got long arms and long fingers, and his legs were, you know, like a frog when it jumps. A lot of hair, you know, and had a real, real huge head about the size of a pumpkin, you know. Well, I saw the head of it, and it was real huge and hairy. What did it look like to you? An egg. Thousands of people claim to have seen Bigfoot over the years. But nobody has ever captured a real creature. Until physical evidence such as hair, bones, or an actual Bigfoot is verified, science will always struggle to accept its existence. Leading the scientific community in that challenge is Jeff Meldrum, a professor of anatomy and anthropology at the University of Idaho. Contrary to many scientists, he believes that Bigfoot is real and has spent much of the last two decades looking for proof of its existence. His conviction is based in part on the hundreds of footprint casts he has collected from eyewitnesses over the years. This particular footprint is a good example of a classic or a typical Sasquatch footprint. It shows some distinctive characteristics, a very broad heel, which is an important adaptation for supporting this large, massive weight. The breadth across the forefoot, likewise. The toes tend to be more subequal. That is, there's less distinction between the big toe and the lateral digits. To Jeff Meldrum, the footprints provide strong evidence for the existence of a giant bipedal creature, as does the remarkable similarity between them. This rounded shape that you see here is very distinctive. That same feature is quite obvious in this footprint as well. This from the Blue Mountains in the 1980s and this from 1967, the similarity of these two footprints is remarkable. Footprints and eyewitness accounts may support the idea that Bigfoot exists, but they are not hard scientific evidence. What Professor Meldrum needed was something that could directly link sightings of Bigfoot to an actual living creature, something that could undeniably prove its existence. The day after seeing what he believes was a Bigfoot, retired Army medic Jason Miller returned to the location of his encounter. I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I thought to myself, there's got to be some sort of evidence up there. So the following day, I came back to this exact spot, and there was a fresh pile of an unusual looking scat. The hair samples came from this spot, the exact spot. I put on some rubber gloves, and I carefully removed it from the ground, placed it in a Ziploc bag, and took it home. Jason Miller's samples are exactly the kind of physical evidence that Professor Meldrum has been looking for. Dr. Meldrum, these samples were obtained with the greatest of care. I'm very excited, RE, the 71013 specimen, 
Due to the fact the visual was 30 yards and the fecal material was so fresh, I'm hoping some hair was caught as it had its bowel movement. Please contact me if any questions arise. Jason B. Miller. Dr. Meldrum knows that if the scientific community is ever going to accept the existence of Bigfoot, hard evidence, like unique DNA, will be crucial. If we come up with a novel sequence, that will indicate that a, an unknown species is out there. If such a species were identified right here, literally, in our backyard, that will be a sobering uh, implication for science, that there still are many, many discoveries yet to be made. So here's some uh, Kodachrome slides of it. This is a bear hair, and one of the distinguishing characteristics is the presence of a, of a large, substantial medulla, the central core of the shaft. Now, most, most non-human hair shafts will have a fairly substantial medulla that takes up oftentimes as much or more than half of the diameter of the hair shaft. Here we have an orangutan hair. It likewise has a substantial medulla. Meldrum feels that the presence of a medulla is one of the crucial components in distinguishing Bigfoot from other animals. Sample here exhibits a moderate thickness of the shaft, parallel sides, the lack of a tapered tip, and very significantly, the lack of a cellular medulla. Those are all characteristics that we cannot readily attribute to normal wildlife. Samples from Texas, from Northern California, from Washington State, from Canada, all collected independently of one another, all remarkably consistent and displaying a suite of characteristics that we cannot readily attribute to any known species of wildlife out there. Meldrum feels that some of the hair samples he received could provide evidence for the existence of an unknown species. In a rare step, he has sent them to a specialized laboratory for DNA testing. Our techniques have gotten very sensitive, whereas 30 years ago, we would have actually needed a blood or tissue sample to be able to characterize the DNA. Now we can work from single cells, a shed hair, a tiny bit of saliva on something it ate, or even the feces that it leaves behind. Professor Todd Dissetel is an evolutionary primatologist and one of the world's top experts in extracting and interpreting DNA from hair samples. Here are the hair samples. It looks like Dr. Meldrum sent me eight different samples for DNA analysis. DNA from hair or from actually any other source can identify all the way down to the individual, or we can back it up to the species or the group that it belongs to. So a purported Bigfoot sample to actually have come from whatever Bigfoot is, it would have to be a DNA signature that is primate, but not from any known primate species. It has to fall outside the range of all known primates. If these hair samples turn out to be some new species of primate here in North America, the implications would be astounding. On the evolutionary tree, humans fall into a group called the Great Apes, which includes orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. But about six million years ago, a fundamental split occurred, bipedalism. Humans started to walk on two legs. The others did not. Some believe that Bigfoot is an undiscovered species of Great Ape, one that evolved to become bipedal. This belief stems from the existence of a prehistoric creature named Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus is an interesting case. It was discovered in a very odd circumstance. Donald Prothero is a mammalian paleontologist, an expert in deciphering the roots of ancient species. A series of paleontologists who are working in northern China discovered that if they went to the Chinese apothecaries, they had lots and lots of fossil teeth in their possession. And the Chinese believed they'd ground down these fossil teeth that would make a medicine that would cure various ailments. And they called them dragon teeth in the Chinese culture. They managed to track down which caves these people were raiding to get these teeth from. And so they found these gigantic molars that are ape-like, but much larger than any ape alive now. It is thought that Gigantopithecus evolved about one million years ago. 
appearing along the orangutan line, it grew to huge proportions. I'm holding in my hands a replica of a lower jaw of Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus is only known from lower jaws, from upper teeth, and some fragments of upper jaws. There is no more complete skeletal material known for it. And yet, even from this lower jaw, we can tell right away that it's just gigantic. If you want to make a comparison here, this is a modern human skull. If you hold the teeth up side by side, it immediately strikes you that these are huge compared to any modern human. Paleontologists estimate that Gigantopithecus stood more than three meters tall and weighed up to 540 kilograms. Eyewitness descriptions of Bigfoot seem almost identical. This similarity has led some to hypothesize that Bigfoot is a direct descendant of Gigantopithecus, still living amongst us today. I have long held that it is most likely a, a large species of ape. Uh, Gigantopithecus had been proposed. In that species, you have uh, an ape that's the right size in the right place at the right time to be a very logical candidate as an ancestor for Sasquatch. But Gigantopithecus is thought to have been extinct for 300,000 years. Its fossil record stops at 300,000 years ago, and that's very significant because thousands and thousands of fossils are known from younger Ice Age deposits, and in no case did Gigantopithecus show up. It's not an absence of any fossils, it's just an absence of Gigantopithecus fossils. If Gigantopithecus disappeared hundreds of thousands of years ago, then it seems unlikely that Bigfoot would be one of its descendants. The other possibility is that Bigfoot could be an undiscovered species that evolved along the human line of the evolutionary tree. But for a long time, evolutionary anthropologists thought that only one species of human, primitive or not, could ever live at a time. The old idea about human evolution was driven by the notion that since there's only one species of human on the planet today, that there would only be one species of human at a time. And then the fossil record finally became good enough to show that that, in fact, was false. The fossil record suddenly showed that multiple species of primitive humans, all bipedal and intelligent, once lived at the same time. The rule, rather than the exception, was that there were multiple species of hominid coexisting across the landscape. And so it's kind of difficult, in my mind, to be so adamant about our singularity in the face of so much evidence that suggests that there could be other hominid species occupying remote corners of this, uh, of this landscape. The problem was that fossils indicated the last time that this had happened was at least 100,000 years ago. Then, in 2003, a remarkable discovery was made. The bones of Homo floresiensis were found in a cave on the island of Flores in Indonesia. Thought to be a primitive human species, they may have lived as recently as 12,000 years ago. The youngest fossils attributed to it uh, date to sometime between 12 and 20,000 years ago. Um, I mean, that's just a, a snap of the fingers in geologic time. That really raises the possibility that there are other relic hominoids, that uh, things like the Sasquatch, for example, may in fact live beside us today. But paleontologist Donald Prothero is highly skeptical that a creature like Bigfoot could remain undetected on Earth today. We are not a place where there's much that can hide on land anymore. And in places like the Pacific Northwest, where the Bigfoot sightings are most common, people think it's a forest primeval. No, it's been logged hundreds of times. And one of the reasons it's important is because an animal the size of Bigfoot wouldn't be a singleton. It would be a large population. There would be, have to be many of them for it to persist in that area, which means the forest area is not big enough to sustain a population of animals that large without us detecting them. But animals previously thought to be extinct have been discovered before. In 1938, fishermen off the coast of South Africa caught a fish named coelacanth, thought to have gone extinct 66 million years ago. 
The so-called Asian unicorn, otherwise known as the Saula, was considered by many Westerners to be a native myth until it was discovered in Vietnam in 1992. Every year, scientists discover roughly 15,000 new species. The vast majority are incredibly small, such as tiny insects or microscopic mollusks. But there are exceptions. In 2004, a species of giant chimpanzee called the billy ape, rumored to hunt lions and sleep on the ground just like humans, was found alive deep in the Congolese jungle. Could Bigfoot be the next species to emerge? The temperate rainforests, I believe, are Sasquatch's primary and core habitat. Uh, the rainforests, the temperate rainforests along the Pacific Northwest coast throughout the Northwest Jeff Meldrum is certain that Bigfoot exists. It's just that we haven't found it yet. He believes the place to look is in the Pacific Northwest. We're, we're right kind of on the border of what would be ideal habitat, we believe, for Sasquatch. There seems to be a high correlation with a minimum of 16 to 18 inches of precipitation per year in order for there to be sufficient growth in the understory to be productive enough to support large omnivores. Every year, hundreds of Bigfoot sightings are reported across America. From Florida, up the eastern seaboard, even in Texas. But they occur in the Pacific Northwest far more than anywhere else. Jeff Meldrum believes that the area's lush, dense forests offer the right conditions to sustain a giant primate and the right landscape for it to remain undiscovered by humans. Going off trail and cutting cross country through here would be extremely tough going for us humans, but a, a large bipedal muscular primate can go up and down those ridge lines with very little, uh, very little difficulty. I'd have to say, in, in this kind of terrain, it'd be very easy to remain unnoticed. You can't be a skeptic anymore. You can't deny what you saw. So you can't lie to people and say, I've never seen it, because you did. Retired policeman David Higley saw a Bigfoot in northern Idaho. Came around the side of the hill on a game trail, and I got a real strange smell of something like it was dead. And I probably walked another 15, 20 yards and came around a big set of pine trees in the trail, and uh, Bigfoot was standing right in front of me, about 25 feet away. Eight foot tall, 750, 800 pounds, and nothing but hair and muscle. And I mean hair and muscle. Big black lips, big black nose, big brown eyes. Kind of a round dome-shaped head. Huge. Huge. And then he just kind of turned his head to the right and did a big whoo, and then just run down off the side of the hill. Just like David Higley, thousands of people in America are convinced they've seen Bigfoot. But the locations of these sightings correlate closely with the habitat of another type of creature, bears. Bears are native to many parts of America, but their population is highest in the Pacific Northwest. A grizzly bear will be anywhere from about 250 to upwards of 1,000 pounds anywhere from uh, my height, which is about five feet, six inches, to over nine feet tall. AJ Schlebnik is the curator of education at the Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center in West Yellowstone, Montana. She has been observing bears for more than 10 years. Uh, they tend to have big lips that they can use to get around bones. Their nose, of course, is very powerful, and so it is a very prominent feature on their face. 
When people encounter grizzly bears, they'll report that they smell like rotten or dead animals. Often that bear has been rolling around and feeding on an animal carcass of some sort and has retained some of that smell. Up to three meters tall, weighing up to 450 kilograms, and covered in brown, smelly fur, bears closely match many of the descriptions of Bigfoot. Except for one key fact, eyewitnesses always describe Bigfoot as walking on two legs. Bears tend to walk on four most of the time. So that is Grant, and Grant is trying to get a bird feeder out of the tree. We've put dry dog kibble and raw elk meat in that bird feeder. For a bear to walk on two hind legs does take a lot of energy, so it's not extraordinarily common, but it definitely does happen, usually when they're trying to get to a food source. The extent to which bears are able to walk on two legs was captured on home video in suburban New Jersey in 2014. Anytime I see a bear from a distance, it takes me a while to figure out exactly what I'm looking at when I'm out hiking in the wild. So I suppose it would be possible to confuse a bear with another sort of creature or animal. A bear walking on two legs could explain many Bigfoot sightings, in particular in the Pacific Northwest. But what about the physical evidence, all the footprints that have been collected over the years? It was the photograph taken in 1951 that started our modern obsession with Bigfoot. It seemed to show footprints of a giant bipedal creature. But could it actually have been a case of mistaken identity? With the help of a grizzly bear, AJ is now going to try to recreate that footprint. So what we're going to do in a few minutes is Sam, our biggest grizzly bear, is going to come out into the habitat. And he is going to hopefully walk through several dirt piles that we've set up. The way that we get bears to do things that we would like for them to do is through food. So what we've got here is we've got a dirt pile that we've wetted down sprinkled with bananas and raspberries and grapefruits and oranges. We want to see if he will come and walk through the dirt piles and we can capture some of the tracks that he makes in the mud. The footprints will be used to make plaster casts and compared to Eric Shipton's famous photograph. AJ to Chris. We're ready for Sam. Grizzly ignores the first two piles. But then, finally, he steps into the third, leaving a fresh set of tracks behind. After the bear has left, AJ returns with a bucket of plaster ready to make casts of the footprints. I think I saw him make some good ones while he was out there. Ooh, yeah, that's a really good one. I like that. Yeah, so you can, you pour the plaster in and then kind of what we'll probably have to do is we'll have to kind of dig out the dirt around it and flip it over once it dries to get it out. So yeah, so if you were making a cast of a, of, of a Bigfoot footprint, you would probably do it in a similar way. So we'll let that dry. The next stage, to compare the bear casts with the photographs that started our obsession with the creature. This one turned out really good. Could they help explain the hundreds of prints people have discovered in the Pacific Northwest and one of the most famous photographs in Bigfoot lore? So these are the cast, the tracks that we took in the bear habitat earlier. Uh, this is a bear back foot, and then this is a bear front foot. The bear track for the hind foot looks very similar to what you would expect from a, from a human footprint as well. We got five toes, only much, much bigger. While the casts bear a striking resemblance to large humanoid footprints, 
bears have a specific way of walking that could even explain some of the truly giant big footprints. When bears walk around, usually their back foot will end up in front of their front foot as they walk naturally. But sometimes as they're walking, their tracks will overlap. If a bear's back foot was to step into a track left by its front foot, you could see something that looked a little bit like this, or even like this. And that would definitely look a little bit larger. You can see the back foot is 12 inches by itself, but if it were tra two tracks combined, then you might see 14 or even 15 inches. Just because of the way bears walk and the fact that they have five toes like people do, I could easily see how it might look like a footprint of another bipedal animal or a humanoid animal. When comparing the 1951 photograph taken by Eric Shipton with the footprint cast, we can see some remarkable similarities. The general shape looks very similar to uh, the back footprint that we took. For bears, the toes are reversed, so their big toes on the outside and their little toes on the inside. This pattern is clearly visible in both Shipton's photograph and the cast of the bear's footprint. The shape of the heels is also remarkably similar, and both show evidence of a slipping foot. I mean, if I saw this, I would think it was a bear track. <laughs> So could the 1951 footprint which started our obsession with Bigfoot be a case of mistaken identity? But there are many prints that look nothing like bear tracks. In particular, the footprints that brought Bigfoot to America, cast by Jerry Crew in 1958. What could explain these tracks? We know for a fact who Bigfoot is. When a man named Ray Wallace died in 2002, his wife and children decided it was time to go public with a long-held family secret. It was just a joke, just to get people, you know, scare them a little bit or make them think a little bit, but it just, it just really went over big. In 1958, Wallace was in charge of a road crew in Northern California. According to his family, he wanted to play a practical joke on his co-workers, so he made some giant wooden feet, strapped them over his boots, and walked through the mud around the construction site. One of Wallace's workers was Jerry Crew. It seemed that the first set of alleged footprint casts ever made, which brought Bigfoot mania to America, were just the result of a giant hoax. This is baby Bigfoot. <laughs> According to the family, Ray Wallace took his footprints all over Northern California, Oregon, and Washington State. He even managed to convince his wife, Elna, to dress up in a giant fur suit. I said, just think, somebody comes over the top of that hill and sees me in this suit, go shoot me, think I'm Bigfoot. <laughs> Suddenly, every Bigfoot story was seen in an entirely different light. Over the years, countless claims purporting to prove the existence of Bigfoot have been revealed as fake. A 1996 video claiming to show a running Bigfoot in Washington state was later revealed to be a man in a fur suit. In 2008, two men claimed to have found the dead body of a Bigfoot and even went so far as to release videos of it in a freezer covered in ice. They later admitted that it was a costume filled with roadkill. This, that's all this was, was a, a big joke. It, it kind of, it, it got into something way bigger than what it was supposed to be. In 2004, even the famous Patterson-Gimlin film was revealed to be a hoax when a man named Bob Hieronymus told the world that he was hired to dress up in a specially made Bigfoot outfit. He even agreed to take a lie detector test on television. Was that you? in a Bigfoot costume portrayed in the 1967 Patterson film. Yes. I was supposed to have been paid for wearing a suit in the woods, you know. I didn't care what they'd done with the suit, you know, or what they'd done with the film. The evidence was piling up against the existence of Bigfoot. But could out-and-out -out hoaxes and misinterpreted sightings really explain all of the thousands of Bigfoot reports recorded in America? 
I guarantee it wasn't a bear. I know what a black bear looks like. I've seen grizzly face to face. There's neither one of those. To mistake Bigfoot for a bear at 25 feet, they gotta be smoking some weird stuff. You can't mistake that. And I was stone sober. In July 2013, Jason Miller and his daughter Haley saw what they were convinced was a living creature unlike anything they'd ever seen before. That night, they returned home and decided to draw what they'd seen. I kept thinking to myself, this is of such great importance that I need to document this. I asked my daughter to go into a separate room to draw a picture of what she saw. That way, we wouldn't contaminate each other's drawings. There is no doubting the sincerity of people like David Higley, Jason Miller, and his daughter, nor the majority of the thousands of other people who claim to have seen Bigfoot throughout America. But the human brain is an incredibly complex organ, and it can often make mistakes when interpreting the world around us. We feel at every waking moment like we're taking in the entire world in front of us and seeing it in rich detail, but it's not true. It's a lie that our brains are telling us. Brian Scholl is a world-renowned experimental psychologist who specializes in perception. In fact, we only see the tiniest part of the visual field in, in clear, high resolution at any given moment. About, about one degree, about the width of your thumb held at arm's length. The rest of the world at any given moment is incredibly fuzzy and it's impossible to recognize what's going on there. Our eyes only capture clearly a tiny fraction of the information in the world around us. So our brains work to fill in the gaps. You feel like you see a fruit stand because as you're moving your eyes around, you always see fruit. But who knows what's going on in your peripheral vision at any given moment? There are experiments uh, that show us that you can do amazing things in people's peripheral vision, and they'll have no idea what's going on. You could have a bunch of peaches and bananas and rubber balls, and until you look directly at those rubber balls, you will remain completely blind to them. So the brain is always making these detective-like guesses, and there's always the possibility that it will get things wrong. There are two fundamental elements of perception that help to explain how easy it is for our brains to get things wrong. The first is known as pareidolia, a process that tells the brain to recognize faces and bodies wherever possible. Perceiving these things is so important, has been so important in the course of our evolution, that we have specialized neural circuitry, special aspects of visual processing that are devoted to recognizing faces and to recognizing bodies. As a result, those systems even operate a little bit too much, causing us to see faces when they're not really there, causing us to see bodies when they're not really there. The second way that the brain can be influenced is a concept known as priming. Maybe you're thinking about your Aunt Matilda, and so you then are more likely to see your Aunt Matilda when you see someone from the back, say, at a distance that looks like it could be her. But other things can be primed in all of us by modern popular culture. So if the popular milieu is getting us to think of, say, Bigfoot or Jaws or whatever it is, that's going to make it all the more likely to actually perceive that concept in any context when the information is ambiguous. The mechanics of perception show how a fleeting glance of an animal, such as a bear, could be mistaken for something else, even Bigfoot. But many people who claim to have seen Bigfoot describe staring at the creature for extended periods of time, up to several minutes. With plenty of time to evaluate what they're seeing, is it possible that their brains could still misinterpret it? Yale psychologist Brian Scholl is about to recreate a classic experiment which could hold the answer. So we are going to run a little experiment here. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Participants sitting in pairs are shown an image and asked to identify it. The image starts totally blurred, essentially indecipherable, 
Then over 10 stages, it is brought into sharp focus. For every picture that I show you, just give your best guess as to what it is. At each stage, participants are asked to write down what they see. But while one of the participants sees the image from the very beginning, the other has been asked to keep their eyes closed until halfway through the sequence. I'm going to have you open your eyes now, Mindy. Eyes open. Image number six. Number seven. Image eight. At the end of the test, their answers will be compared. Over the last 50 years, thousands of people claim to have seen Bigfoot in America and have stood by what they saw, even if the scientific evidence doesn't seem to add up. Could the results of Brian Scholl's experiment help explain how a person staring at something for minutes on end can still misinterpret what they are seeing? And can you hand me your sheets? The results are in. The demonstration shows that people who see the image from halfway are quicker to correctly identify it than those who've seen it from the beginning. Why do you think there might have been a difference? Because I think um, my perception was um, misguided from watching it from the beginning. I was still probably focused in my mind, subconsciously, on what I'd already seen. Because you already have a preconceived idea of what it is from the very beginning. So I think for him, he had less images in his head to process, whereas I had a lot more. There you go. And that is exactly the point of the experiment. And so this is an example of how, surprisingly, having more information can actually hurt you, and how our assumptions about what we might be looking at can actually lead us astray. More people claim to have seen Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest than anywhere else in America. Some, like Professor Jeff Meldrum, believe this is because the area's lush, dense forests offer the right conditions to sustain a giant primate and the right landscape for it to remain undiscovered by humans. But others believe that this is the perfect environment to see something that isn't there. Where do you see Bigfoot? Hazily in the distance, in the forest, right? Those are exactly those sorts of ambiguous conditions where, especially if you've got Bigfoot on the mind, you're gonna be much more likely to be led astray by those hunches, maybe mistakenly recognizing Bigfoot in every misshapen tree or strange-looking animal. And what you're left with is as much the story you're telling yourself about what you saw as it is the image that you actually experienced. Perception, misinterpreted footprints, hoaxes, and wild bears. The evidence that a giant bipedal half-man, half-ape exists is being questioned on all fronts. But there is one more piece of missing evidence that could still prove skeptics entirely wrong. In August 2013, retired army medic Jason Miller saw what he is convinced was a Bigfoot. The next day, he returned to the exact same spot and found a collection of hair samples. These samples, along with several more found by other eyewitnesses, were analyzed by Dr. Jeff Meldrum before being sent to a specialized lab for DNA testing. If the results are positive, the implications are profound. They will be huge, earth-shaking, I think, in many ways, because we'll have recognized the existence of a species more closely related to the human family than any other that has previously been discovered or studied. At Todd Dissertel's laboratory at New York University, the DNA results from the hair samples are now complete. So we finally have the results. This is the sequence from Jason Miller's hair sample that he sent to Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Here we see the individual DNA bases, the actual A, C's, G's, and T's that make up the DNA sequence. I'm gonna run it against the international database to see what it might or might not match. 
There's my result. The closest match is Otocoileus virginiensis. That's the American white-tailed deer. The sample that Jason Miller collected the day after his sighting turned out to be an ordinary deer hair. But what about the others Dr. Meldrum had obtained? One of the other samples sent to me by Dr. Meldrum turned out to be a cow. And several of the samples were actually, unfortunately, contaminated with human DNA. DNA analysis of the hair samples has failed to provide any kind of positive proof for the existence of Bigfoot. Despite decades of searching, no samples of a living creature have ever been found, nor have any remains ever been discovered. Examination of the evidence seems to indicate that Bigfoot is most likely to be a case of mistaken identity, a trick of the human mind. Everything that we've learned about Bigfoot is sightings by individuals, usually not qualified in science or in wildlife biology, and they're usually at a large distance. People can be easily misled. People see things all the time that don't exist. People see one thing and then their brain modifies it and they, they change their memories of what they see. This is very well documented by many psychologists. So anyone who brings you eyewitness accounts, scientists discount that right off the bat because it's the least reliable evidence you could have. Scientists are not opposed to the idea of Bigfoot existing on a strictly uh, scientific grounds only. It's because the evidence isn't there, no bones, no hair, nothing. Until they come with something physical that cannot be hoaxed, a real bone or a real piece of hair that gives DNA that would match Bigfoot's, we're not gonna take this kind of stuff seriously. The likelihood of a large ape-like creature living amongst us these days is extraordinarily small. Science can't say it absolutely doesn't exist, but for many reasons, it's extremely unlikely that it does.